Yeah, they're on the actual. You did different color or something? Or? Um, Mine's on the PowerPoint when it pulls it up. If it's on a PowerPoint, it has little, like, it has little, like, post-it note things on it. Yeah. Uh, I on a yeah. So how's everybody? Good. I'm good. I'm good. How was the weekend? Phenomenal. Phenomenal. That's that's strong praise. Um, <laughs> okay. So this is. Uh, one of the last two lectures that I have before uh, before we start getting into uh, the second exam and, and guest lecturers, so um, just to touch base again with where we are in the the um, syllabus. Today I'll lecture on management. Um, we'll have a review session really quick on Thursday. That will not take very long. Um, what's that? Five minutes uh, pretty close, yeah. Um, next Tuesday, I'll lecture on basically on um, financial analysis for that portion of your case template. Um, and then we'll have uh, the second exam on Thursday, and then. We basically have guest lectures for the week after that. The week after that is Thanksgiving. The week after Thanksgiving, we'll have more guest lectures, and then uh, we'll have a, a assessment of learning test, which is for you guys take the test, but it's grading me on how well I've taught you. So we're not graded on it. Huh? We're not graded on it. Uh, you get ten points if you take it. Oh. You know the oh. score doesn't matter. Uh, and then we'll have a final course wrap-up session, and that's it. Is there a final? There's a final yeah, there's a final online. It's on. Uh, it's on Blackboard. Wait. So our finals, like on week 16, is that that's when finals, like for everyone else's class, is going to be? Yes. The last day of, of like, the last day that we actually meet as a class is. Yeah, the last day of like the whole semester is like. Yeah, I think the week of the semester itself is. Yeah. Diego, yes. Are you also going to explain what your comments mean? Yeah, I'll. Uh, I'll explain the comments on the feedback briefly. Um, it's similar comments for everybody. So on your mid-range goals, um, if you are looking for a particular type of job, uh, I basically ask for you to apply for 10 jobs. Um, and then uh, you, all you need to do is just send me a list of the companies that you applied to. Um, if you already got a certain career or job that you like and you're focused on, I asked you for a one-page summary of what, what do you need to do next at your, at your job. And then for your 
long-term finances, I wanted you to put together a pro forma budget, which basically plans on how much you need to save in order to reach some of your future financial goals that you have. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so does that answer the questions? Yep. Okay, cool. So without further ado, I will open up the slides on management analysis. So once again, we're talking about supporting organizational arrangements for the handbrake strategy. Did you press play? Did I press? Yes, I did. Okay. This time I remembered to press play. A record. record. Um, we're over here in the strategy implementation section of the, uh, the textbook, basically talking about chapter 12, strategic leadership. So there's two different activities that we, that we talk about in this class. Most of what we've talked about is crafting the strategy. So that's primarily a, a market-driven activity, so it's driven by the external environment. Um, and a successful strategy Crafting depends on attracting and pleasing customers, uh, selecting and building the company's resources and capabilities, and making a profit balancing the first two elements. So most of what we've talked about, um, most of what we talked about in this class so far is um, crafting the strategy, whether it's uh, customer analysis or internal analysis, external analysis, corporate level strategy, business level strategy, uh, competition, um, most of that, and, and really the uh, corporate social responsibility stuff that we talked about last time as well um, is all kind of related to crafting the strategy. Today's lecture is about executing the strategy. So that's primarily an operations driven activity. It's actually what it's about what goes on in the in the company on a day-to-day -day basis and successful execution depends on management's ability to direct change improve operations build a strategy supportive culture and get things done to deliver good results so kind of a, a difference in what i'm talking about today versus many of the the class sessions we've had before um, there's eight main components of strategy execution that I'm going to talk about today. Um, building an organization capable ex of executing the strategy successfully. So how do we build a successful organization? Uh, allocating ample resources to strategy critical activities. So how do we make decisions about um, re allocating resources in the company? instituting policies and procedures that facilitate strategy execution. So what, what internal policies and procedures do we need to have in order for things to function smoothly in the organization? Uh, pushing for continuous improvement in how value chain activities are performed. So we'll talk a little bit about how, how to make sure that you're continually getting better as an organization, as a manager. Um, Installing information and operating systems that will enable company personnel to carry out their strategic roles proficiently. Um, so information, IT, whether it's hardware or software, um, is critical to the, uh, the execution of, of the strategy internally in an organization. So getting the right hardware and software in place is something that we'll talk about briefly. Um, tying rewards and incentives directly to achievement of performance targets. So you want your reward system in the organization, both comp uh, monetary and non-monetary compensation to support your, uh, 
your performance targets in the organization. Uh, instilling a corporate culture that promotes good strategy execution. So um, we'll talk a little bit about different types of corporate cultures and um, how to how to instill a, 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 a certain way of doing things, a certain culture in the organization that you're uh, you're leading. And then finally, exerting strong leadership to drive execution forward and attain operating excellence. So basically talking a little bit about what what good leadership looks like in uh, in, in large organizations um, how to how to inspire and uh, and support employees um, this is a more a slightly more uh, detailed map of the same components that I just talked about this is I believe the current version of your textbook the prior version of the textbook had eight, now they've got 10. Um, so, organization. Um, to assemble an organization that's uh, supportive of the, the strategic goals of the, of the company, um, you wanna put together a capable management team. Um, and really this is about finding people who can make things happen and putting them into each slot that you need in the company. Um, existing management team may be suitable. You may end up promoting from within. Um, the core executive group may need strengthening, however, so you may end up um, bringing in skilled folks from the outside if, uh, if necessary. And the key here is really to empower empower employees, empower your staff. Um, you want to hire people who are capable of doing the work you need done and then empower them to do it rather than micromanaging them. Um, part two of building the organization, uh, tactics commonly used to staff an organization with best quality people. Careful screening of applicants, investing in employee training, providing promising employees with stretch, skill stretch assignments, um, rotating people through different jobs in uh, different functional areas and regions geographically, striving to retain high performers via promotions and pay increases, and coaching average performers to improve their abilities. So I made a little, made some comments in red on the on the margins of these slides here to talk a little bit about my own experience with these things. Um, when I was running my, my lead generation company, Market Driver, um, screening of applicants was, uh, was a really challenging thing to do. I, I think I went through 15 different temps trying to find the right person to, uh, to be able to make sales calls in the way that I needed them made. Um, so finding the right person to begin with is, is key. Um, that was a real, <laughs> was a real challenge. I, I never, in some ways I never really found the right person. That's one of the reasons why the company uh, didn't work is because I couldn't find, I couldn't hire the right staff to do the work. Um, but that's the sort of the baseline of, baseline of building the organization is finding the right people to begin with. And then. Um, my, my time that I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers was a great example of almost all the rest of these things. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers is uh, it's a, a company based on the, the, the skills and talents of the, the people that are in it. It's a consulting organization, so the, the extent to which the people in that organization have certain knowledge, skills, and abilities is that's that's the product that they sell so they were really good at investing in employee training they sent us to training sessions all the time to learn new software packages learn new new consulting techniques um, they provided us with really great challenging assignments it was super fun to that was the only real job um, I don't consider this a real job uh, teaching is, uh, is is a pretty relaxed profession 
Um, but the, the only real job not working for myself that I ever liked was PricewaterhouseCoopers. It was uh, it was a really cool. I worked with a bunch of worked with a bunch of smart people on challenging problems. Uh, it was it was fun to it was like solving puzzles all the time. So uh, the the assignments that they put us on were really kind of stretching our abilities. It was cool. Um, they rotated us through different functional areas. So I started out doing business development. I then eventually moved over to doing change management consulting for local government and then they switched me to IT consulting for fe the federal government and just switched around through different different uh, assignments. That was really interesting as well. Um, retaining high performance with promotions and pay increases. I got a nice promotion after the first year and a nice pay increase. Uh, Pricewaterhouse was always great at paying top dollar for for talent, so I was happy with my, my salary when I was there and coaching average performers to improve their abilities. Um, I don't know if I was average. I'd like to think I was above average, but um, there's a great, great mentoring tradition at Pricewaterhouse where um, one, of the, one of the managers of uh, the different consulting lines will kind of take you under his or her wing and, um, and make sure that you are developing the right way as a professional. So, it was a really great supportive environment for all those things and these are the things that you need to do in order to build a, the to, in order to build an organization which is staffed with the kind of people that you need to be successful as an organization um, this is a figure from your book that I thought was useful to put in here right now uh, building an organization capable of proficient strategic execution three types of paramount actions so there's staffing the organization, acquiring, developing, and strengthening key resources and capabilities, and structuring the organization and work effort. Um, part of that is about gathering resources together, um, these first two here, and part of it is about building an organizational structure that uh, supports your, your strategy as an organization. Um, as far as staffing is concerned, like I said before, hiring the right people is key. So putting together a strong management team and recruiting and retain, retaining talented employees are the, the key foci on staffing the organization. As far as acquiring, developing, and strengthening key resources and capabilities, um, you want to develop a set of resources and capabilities that's suited to your current strategy. So. Um, whether it's people, uh, financial resources, um, IT resources, um, operational or, or manufacturing resources, they, they need to be suited and, and aligned with the current strategy of the organization. Um, updating resources and capabilities as external conditions in the firm's strategy change. So as the firm reacts to various things in the environment, as strategy develops and morphs over time, you need to make sure to change your resource mix so that it's, it's still supportive of your strategy. And then training and retaining company personnel to maintain knowledge-based and skills-based capabilities. So that's kind of a lot of what I was talking about with Price Waterhouse. I mean, you want to, you want to invest in the knowledge, skills, and abilities of your, your, your employees and then keep them. Um, so that's arguably your most important resource of all is, uh, is the people in the organization and um, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you help them develop and maintain. And then finally, structuring the organization and work effort, uh, instituting organizational arrangements that facilitate good strategy execution. So you want to set up an organizational structure that actually uh, is also supportive of your overall strategy. Um, you want to establish lines of authority and reporting relationships that also support the, the strategic direction of the organization. And then finally, um, you need to decide how much decision-making authority to delegate. And in general, in general, it's a good idea to delegate and push out or push down decision-making authority as much as possible. 
so it's dispersed throughout the organization. Um, investing resources, allocating resources in ways to support effective strategy includes funding proposals that hold promise while turning down those that don't, providing proper amount of funding to support new strategic initiatives and new strategies call for the reallocation of resources. So um, one example from my own past that was a great one for resource allocation was the time that I spent with Bertelsmann, um, the basically BMG. Um, it's a music and music and uh, and media company in Germany, and I often thought uh, when I worked there that the the head management of Bertelsmann doesn't actually know anything about the media business. Um, what they did know really well is how to buy things cheap and sell them. For a, a, a markup, so they they were great at finding small companies that uh, had promise, investing in them when they were obscure, and then selling them again when they got big. Um, so, uh, great great organization for deciding which which new ventures, both internally to the organization as well as uh, external ones that we we acquired. Um, great at deciding where to where, where to allocate resources. Yes. Um, for the example of Bickelsman, um, because they're really good at like buying low, selling high with like these media companies, doesn't that imply that they need to know like some like some knowledge depth of media, or or not necessarily? Um, one would think, but uh, I was always frustrated when I was there at the way that they actually managed the businesses while they held them. Uh, it made me question whether they actually knew much about the media business, right. but uh, it's when you're what you don't know, right? uh, theoretically, but then you actually have to empower people to do what they need to do rather than holding them back. So one would think, one would think, and perhaps they do know, and uh, that's they just don't care about the operational running of the businesses as much as they do about the, the purchase and sale of them. Right. Um, but that was that was my experience while I was there. Mm -hmm. um, policies and procedures. Uh, these facilitate good strategy execution by providing top-down guidance regarding how things need to be done, enforcing consistency in how strategy critical activities are performed, and promoting a work climate that facilitates good strategy execution. So um, a good example of policies and procedures is the way that I do my grading. Um, so there's in an ideal world I would in an ideal world I would tailor the grading to each individual in here um, so that it's it's maximally helpful for your own career um, that's I can't do that with because of time constraints so um, I end up doing things like I did with the uh, the professional development plans, which is to have kind of standard comments that I put on them um, and then explain the standard comments in class. Um, uh, as, as organizations get bigger, uh, as organizations get bigger, it, uh, you tend to have to have some kind of uh, policies and procedures in order to manage, manage the day-to-day uh, the, the -day interaction of people. Otherwise, it becomes too complex and, and complicated really quickly. So having the right policies and procedures in place um, is increasingly necessary as the organization gets larger. Continuous improvement. Searching out and adopting best practices is really integral for effective implementation. So you, you want to always be out there looking for how, how, how are people, how are other organizations doing things the best possible. Um, benchmarking is the backbone of the process of identifying, studying, and implementing best practices. So um, comparing your organization to others um, in a benchmarking method is uh, kind of a key activity to, to 
keep yourself honest with strive, continuous improvement. Um, and you want to expose yourself to new ideas, colleagues, companies, industries, academia. Um, my, my two examples of this, PricewaterhouseCoopers was great at having databases. Databases uh, for the best practices of anything we could possibly imagine. So um, there was a project that I worked on where there's a project I worked on for the Washington, D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development. And we were, we were contracted to come in, take a look at the organization from top to bottom, and make suggestions as to whether, make suggestions as to whether they needed to get rid of staff, hire new more staff, um, whether the activities they were involved in were the correct activities to be involved in as, a, as an organization. Um, and in order to, to do that project, we went to some database resources that we had that, um, that summarized the operations of other departments of housing and community development in other cities around the country so that we could kind of compare the metrics of how much, how much money was actually passed through the organization invested in the community, how many staff for compared to the size of the city, um, what were the lines of business that other, other organizations were involved in. Um, that kind of benchmarking helped us a lot to, to make our suggestions on that project. And then the last one here, exposing yourself to new ideas, colleagues, companies, industries, and academia. Um, one of the things that I noticed, one of the things that was a, a, a challenge or a problem for me when I was running my, my lead generation service market driver was that I was always so busy, I was always so busy trying to close the next deal, trying to do the next thing for customers that I never spent any time improving, improving the way I did things. Um, I never got out of my own narrow tunnel vision and talk to other people about how to make my organism, how to make my company better. So you really need to make sure as a manager that you're pushing yourself to expose yourself to new ideas, talk to colleagues uh, both in your industry and in other industries, um, look at companies, other companies besides your own, in your own industry and other industries um, and talk to people in academia like me. Like that's the nice thing about being a professor is that we have time to study things uh, in more depth than than business organizations do. Business businesses have to be productive and meet bottom line goals. They can't they can't indulge in the luxury of, of studying things for academic sake. But the stuff that we study here in academia. Um, helps to make organizations better. And I wish when I had been running my company that I had talked to academics more often. It would have really given me some fresh perspective on how to run things. So you want to make sure to expose yourself to as much, as many different ideas, different colleagues and in, uh, in different industries and, and also in academia as you possibly can. Uh, information systems. Good information systems and operating systems are essential for first-rate strategy execution. They're needed to track and report customer data, operations data, employee data, supplier data, financial data. Um, I, I have two, two examples that were particularly interesting or useful in my, my own past of, of this stuff here. Um, customer and employee data in particular. Um, when I was at Robert Half, um, Robert Half does an awesome job of keeping a database of all interactions that have ever taken place with any customer out there. So when I, when I went in and did my work as a sales rep, there really were no strangers that I ever talked to. I always had notes that somebody else had talked to this organization before and left in the database for me. So um, 
they did a great job of tracking customer data and a great job of tracking uh, employee or consultant data. We, we were a, a headhunting company, so we would constantly be interviewing new people with different skill sets that we could put on projects and, and, and bill out on project work. Um, so we had this huge, complex database of uh, different people's skills and abilities and resumes and, and everything. Uh, it was a really great, great system of, uh, of both customer data and employee data. And then my time at Bergelsman, um, operations and supplier data in particular, um, we, over the time that I was there, we did a, a major system conversion over to SAP which is a, an enterprise resource, uh, enterprise resource planning system. Um, it basically is a software package that is for the entire organization. It covers finances, it covers um, manufacturing, it covers distribution, it covers marketing, it covers everything. So um, we, we, implemented this system in particular for our operations data. So um, we were we were basically in the business of, of shipping out CDs, books, other kind of stuff from a warehouse to customers all around Germany and determining what item gets shipped where for what price, what the cost was to make it. Um, what the marketing dollars associated with it were, what marketing programs were, or what advertising activities were engaged in for that product were all coordinated through this SAP system. So a really great, great example of uh, a large complex system that really helped us to, helped us to do our, uh, our, our, our mission as an organization better. Uh, at Bertelsmann. Uh, rewards and incentives. Reward systems should include both monetary rewards and non-monetary rewards. Um, so on the monetary side, base pay increases, bonuses, profit sharing plans, stock options, piecework incentives. On the non-monetary side, praise and recognition, stimulating assignments, autonomy, and rapid promotion. Um, it's really important to motivate your, your employees properly. If you don't motivate your employees properly, then you're, you're dead in the water for anything else that you try to do as an organization. Um, I had a great, great exposure to both monetary and non-monetary incentives during my time at PricewaterhouseCoopers as well. Um, they did a great job of, of increasing base pay. Uh, there was a nice bonus profit sharing plan and even stock options um, for the company eventually. Um, there were no piecework incentives, but otherwise each of those, each of those other four items was uh, something that they did at Pricewaterhouse and it really, uh, really made me feel like a, a sort of first class First class valued employee, the fact that I was paid at a premium, um, compensated well with, with great benefits too. Um, Non-monetarily, uh, the organization was also good at, at telling me I did a good job. So my managers would, uh, would, would you know, tell me on a frequent basis, hey, good job with this, need to change this a little bit. Um, they would put me on really fun projects um, and gave me a lot, gave me and the rest of, uh, of, of my colleagues a lot of autonomy. I mean, we were, we were, I was 23, 24 when I was working there. I mean, I didn't know anything about anything. And they still had me, um, they still had me researching best practices for the, you know, the, the, the kinds of, the, the best practices for uh, um, departments of housing and community development around the nation. 
Um, nobody was looking over my shoulder when I did that. Um, it was really cool to have that level of uh, autonomous responsibility uh, when I was that young. So um, I, I like to say that um, you're never going to recruit top quality talent to begin with if you don't pay top dollar. So if you don't have good financial, if you don't have good monetary incentives, monetary rewards, you're not going to attract the, the best quality people. But the way that you keep people after you've initially got them is with the non-monetary incentives. So it's, it's not so much increases in pay and increases in your benefits that, uh, that motivate people once they are in a job. It's, it's praise and recognition. It's autonomy to work, work uh, to be, be able to have ownership over your work and be proud of it. Um, those, those make a lot more difference in, in retaining employees over time than, than the financial incentives do. But if you don't pay good financial incentives, you're never going to get top quality people to begin with. Uh, organizational culture. Uh, corporate culture, work climate is the product of work practices and behaviors that define how we do things here. The approach to people management and the chemistry of the work environment. Um, it's, it's interesting. A lot of my academic colleagues have a hard time defining or studying culture. It's, uh, it's kind of an amorphous concept. But we all know, we all know, we all have kind of a gut feeling of what company culture is. Um, but the thing I want to say about it here is that uh, it's a lot of it is about this third bullet point here: the, the chemistry of the work environment. How how do people interact with each other? How do people see the outside world? How do they see themselves as part of the company? What is their identity? Um, things like that and the the red items I've got on the bottom here there there's five different examples of very different corporate cultures that I've been a part of over the course of my career so um, the entrepreneurial ventures I was a part of um, it was very much an us against the world mentality so very very strong it's very very strong um, um, collegiality, fraternity within the group of people that was working on the project uh, and kind of an insular insular um, relationship towards the rest of the of the business world. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, like I've already mentioned a little bit, was really great at valuing people. The whole culture at Pricewaterhouse was all about being the best consultant you can be, getting the right skills and training, um, being working on the right assignments, having the right database tools and the, the right uh, consulting tools to do the job properly. It was all about being the best consultant you could be, the best human resource that you could be. Um, the culture at Bertelsmann was, uh, I think it, it varied depending on which de department or division of the company you were in, but the department of the company I was in, it was very much about um, tradition. You know, we've done things like this for the last 50 years, and we're going to continue to do things like this because that's the way we do it. Uh, very much, very much a, a tradition-based organization. Um, Sony, when I worked for Sony Music, Sony was extremely political. Um, th uh, there was a lot of empire building and and fiefdom building and a lot of decisions got made in that organization that had nothing to do with the bottom line and nothing to do with what was good for the organization business-wise a lot of it was what was good for individual managers politically uh, it was a very very like politically intense environment and then robert half um robert half was the most cutthroat uh, culture that I've been a part of it was it was a very very demanding sales culture um, if you it was very much what have you done for me lately um, 
if if you if you had closed a really big deal the week before, um, you know you get con you get congratulated one day, and then the next day it's what do you, what deal are you closing today? Um, it was very very high turnover. Uh, there was about there was over a hundred percent turnover in the year that I was there. So I was I was there for a year, and by the time I left, almost everybody there was new. There were there were a couple people that were long term, um, long term, uh, successful account executives there. But for every one long term successful account executive, there were two or three positions where. Uh, we rotated through two or three people within the course of a year for the same position. It was really, really uh, um, cutthroat uh, culture in terms of of uh, getting getting fired or getting let go if you're not producing high. So, all of those very different types of uh, of corporate cultures. Um, the last one I want to talk about here: leadership. Um, Managers at all levels of the organization must stay on top of what is happening, be adept in determining what problems lie in the path of operating excellence, and push the organization for good results and operating excellence. So uh, there's three things on the, on the left-hand side here that I, I like to sort of sum up leadership under. Um, the first thing is feeling the vibe or managing by walking around NBWA. Um, you've got to, you've got to be in touch with your employees. You've got to actually get out there, talk to people, listen, um, understand what, understand what are the issues that, that your, your staff are facing. And then bubbled up out of that is solving problems. So. You got to find out from your employees what are the problems they are facing, what are the challenges that make it difficult for them to be successful in their jobs, and your job as a leader is to fix those problems. It's not to do the work; it's to fix problems. Um, and of course, then it's your your job to inspire people. You don't you don't want to do the you the increasing the higher up you get in, in management and leadership, the less you actually do. And the more you, the more you are a cheerleader or an, an, an inspire, an inspiration for others. Um, you want to motivate other people more so than than do things yourself. So um, sometimes it's actually it's not very fun uh, to move up in leadership or management because the higher up the higher up you move, the more you have to deal with all the shitty problems. The, the, the problems that are really hard to solve, um, the, that's, that's stuff that uh, the, the, the normal, the sort of rank and file workers don't have to deal with, but the higher up in leadership you get, the more, the more your job is about solving problems all the time rather than, rather than sometimes getting to do the fun stuff. Um, but for that, you get paid a lot of money and you get the, the, the pride of, of, of being a leader. So. Um, it has different different uh, rewards than the actual satisfaction with the work. Um, that's the end of my slides. I want to do one more thing before calling it a day. Um, and that is to go into your case analysis template again. So we talked about Hamburg strategy already. We've talked about driving forces and what I want you to do there. We've talked about key success factors and competitive strength assessment. We've talked about market sizing. What we haven't talked about yet is the managerial execution section. So I wanted to go through a little bit how I want you to fill out this part of the, the case analysis template, and then uh, we'll call it a day. So 
there's four of those eight areas that I lectured on that I want you to find information about your target company on. So um, I've put in red here what I'm looking for information wise. So for the first one, I want to know how does the company recruit, retain, or empower staff? What do they do to do that? Um, for the second one, I want to know what kind of hard software or hardware systems the company actually uses internally. Not what do they sell, but what do they use internally to get uh, operations done. Um, for rewards and incentives, I want to know how the company compensates employees both financially and non-financially. Uh, and then leadership wise, I want to know how senior managers or executives inspire staff, staff or solve specific operational problems. So in order to do this, I'd like you guys to use ProQuest in particular uh, from our library. So if we go to the CSUB website, click on library, click on database list, databases by title, the letter P for ProQuest and then click on ProQuest, open that up. Um, and you can put whatever search terms you want in here. So um, I'm, I think I did Microsoft as an example, and I, I've done Macy's in, as an example. What? Is this the company, or this is the what industry? This is a company. Company name, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. So what's another company? Huh? Walmart, okay, so if I type in Walmart and um, recruiting, for example, Walmart, so Walmart and Amazon are sort of battling over uh, over employees here. Um, Walmart's trying to get help to improve its uh, its image. So that's that's kind of an interesting one. If you click on this, Walmart has helped with recruitment of its suppliers by working families for Walmart even distributing a letter to thousands of suppliers ostensibly from the group that began Walmart is under attack and Walmart and Sands Clubs have the power to do something about it and help protect their businesses. Well, this this is not really this um, it's about recruiting suppliers more than it is about recruiting employees. So I was thinking that if, if this was about trying to build a better image for Walmart to potential employees, that'd be a good one to copy and paste, but it's really more about suppliers. So let's go take a look at the next one. Walmart and Amazon settle fight over recruiting. That's the same as, same as this up here. Maybe this is interesting. Oh, is it 99? Oh yeah, that's a little out of date. So we can actually, um, we can filter this by publication date. So if we just want things since 2010, the Walmart Empire Strikes Back. I, I have no idea from that title what it's about. Um, the world's largest retailer is investing heavily in its brick and mortar operations. Um, it takes forever to get to the word recruiting here, so that's probably not a good example. Hiring by target Walmart to pressure Canadian retailers. U.S. chains head north. Target Corp and Walmart stars plan to hire tens of thousands of workers in Canada over the next. Two. This is a this is a good one. Um, For each of those things that you were just speaking of. Yep. Are we able to just ask maybe a manager of that store? 
Um, yes, but I want at least two of the four boxes to come from ProQuest just so that you get practice using the database. Make sense? Um, so in this case, copying these first two paragraphs here and putting them in the first box here is, uh, is pretty much what we want. Take out the stuff about target. So this tells me something about recruiting employees. You could also put, you could also go in and type Walmart retain the retention of employees. Um, empower um, an employee, whichever, whichever combination of, uh, of, of those terms you want in order to find something and uh, copy and paste it into this, type, this, uh, this chart here. As soon as you found what it is you're looking for, um, I want This little, I want you to copy that little line underneath the title of the article and footnote that. So insert footnote, ProQuest, just like that, okay? Um, so that is organization. For systems, um, take out recruit and put in um, put in internal. operating systems and see what comes back. So again, it's 2007, that's not bad, but let's let's still limit it to recent so company profile and SWOT analysis that's not really going to tell us about internal software um, Walmart successfully influenced supply chain and the necessity of establishing triple A um, this is a pretty good one it's about the the computerized supply chain software and hardware that Walmart uses Yeah, it seemed interesting at first. Here we go. Internal, I right know. Um, yeah, that, that, uh, article there is more of an academic journal article than it is a report about specific software or hardware that the company uses. So 
So that's not finding what we want. Let's try putting internal operating systems in quotes. That may be too specific, but we'll see. So this, this is somewhat interesting. Um, the um, Walmart's planning on uh, investing around $100 million to convert 146 stores to switch out signs, display areas, and internal operating systems. So we could copy that. paste it here and you'll notice ah no, I still did the same thing um, So copy go back up to the top grab this title line here and put oops insert footnote proquest that information there so rewards and incentives. Um, Walmart and let's try non-monetary incentives. See what happens. People always respond to incentives. I don't know. Let's see. No, it's a little too broad. Investors' propensity to litigate, that's not really what we want. So that didn't didn't really find what we wanted here. So let's make this a broader search then for compensation rather than uh, Walmart's employee compensation stands in stark comparison. So this might give us So this is kind of more about what Walmart doesn't do than what it does do, but we could go in here and copy and paste the information about the fact that they don't compensate their employees nearly as well as Costco does and then footnote that. So once again, go back up to the top, grab this line right here, insert footnote. Request there.
And then finally, leadership. How do senior managers and executives inspire staff or solve specific operational problems? Um, a good way a good way to do this one is actually to start by looking up Walmart's corporate officers. So once you've got the names of the corporate executives, you can search on the name of the individual and sometimes it'll bring up information about what they're doing as a leader. So Doug McMillan, let's try that. So this announces the fact that Doug McMillan is the new CEO at Walmart. Um, this is an interview with him. what we do so think of associates and the opportunity we're trying to create for them how can we over these next few years do an even better job of creating opportunities so this is uh, this is an interesting quote from Doug McMillan on how how he plans to sort of inspire and motivate staff going forward for the company if you copy that Paste it here. Um, you can just put this in quotes and attribute it to Doug McMillan, CEO. And then we're going to put the footnote in finally. Copy. Insert footnote, ProQuest. Okay, so now we've got all of them filled out. The only thing we still need to do is clean up the formatting. So first of all, um, I want this to fit on one page. So don't, don't copy and paste so much that it, it runs on to multiple pages. I want just enough so that it fits on one page. Um, and then we want everything to be um, Times New Roman 12 so after you get done after you get done copying and pasting you'll probably have to highlight the uh, highlight the table and do Times New Roman 12 and we want to get rid of the highlight okay so unfortunately we can't get rid of the highlighting by clicking on the, 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 the thing there so we need to go in and delete these areas where it's things are highlighted in yellow and um, replace it with white so it all looks nice and professional oops So we'll 
delete that. Yep. Yeah, so. So, just real quick, because I don't remember what I did yesterday, but much less at the beginning when you first went over this. The case analysis paper is these nine pages, or it's this is the data now, the data that we're gathering, and then we're writing a paper. No, no, no. It's, it's these nine pages. It's those nine pages. Yep. Okay. okay. So, the paper is in addition to this, or is this? Is this. Okay. Paper is this. Okay. So, on the syllabus, it says make sure that we understand which parts you want to our own words and which parts are pasted. So, for example, right now you just copied it, pasted it, put a footnote. Where on this paper do you want your own words? First, first the summary probably for sure. Yep, the summary section is your own words. Mm -hmm. um, the Hamburg strategy can be your own words if uh, if you aren't able to find things by doing a search. I mean, you, you may not find exactly what you're looking for when you do a search here, so that may be in your own words. And if it is, just put in a footnote, this is my opinion, or this is our opinion as a group. Um, in our words, we wouldn't have a footnote, right? Um, in the tables, I want you to footnote even if it's your own words and just say that it is. Uh, driving forces is a copy and paste. Um, this entire section here in, on key success factors and um, competitive strength assessment, that's in your own words. Diego, hang on one second. Um, market sizing is basically in your own words. Um, management analysis is copy paste. And financial analysis is... I mean, these are just calculations here, but the the what you write down at the bottom is your own words. Make sense, mm -hmm. Diego? Yeah, um, hang on. Well, I, yes, I want it completed, but I want to make sure that I'm clear about the date. Yeah, so basically, I want, I want these things in my hand over the, the course of the Thanksgiving week so I can do markups and tell you guys what to edit. So... So... In this case, it's actually the Sunday after. So I want I want your case papers by Sunday the twentieth. No, sorry, it's Sunday the nineteenth. Okay. Yeah. Make sense. Okay. Yep. Other questions? Yes. That's okay. Is it like grade grade or it's more like as long as you guys are better? Um my goal is to my goal is to give you guys all full points on this as long as you do what I ask you to do. The the place where the grades really get differentiated is in the exams. Um, my goal is, is not to grade these down, but just have you, have you do the edits that I told you to to get full, full points. Other questions? Yes, Jennifer. That's okay. The, uh, the instructions are, um, if you are looking for a job after graduation um, and you, you don't know what job yet, it's to apply for 10 jobs and send me a list of those companies 
If you already know what you're going to be doing after graduation, it's to send me a, a one-page summary of what do you what do you do next in your career. And then I also want you to put together a pro forma budget of what are you going to be spending money on in the future, and make sure to make sure to have savings in there so that you can reach your long-term financial goals. Okay. And just send me the spreadsheet. Okay. Yes. Hang on. Diego first. Okay. So I also noticed there's a Globus analysis paper. Yes. We have uh, that lecture. When are we going to go over it? What's that? When are we going to go over the Globus analysis paper? Um, I wasn't planning on going over it in a particular class session. Basically, I want you guys to, I want as a group, I want you to write one page on what you learned from Globus. Oh, so how, do, how, does, how does production, uh, how do the production inputs affect marketing decisions? What, what decisions that you made do you think made the most impact on doing high, high performance as a company? One page like that, yes. One page per group. Per group. And that professional development thing, when do you want to do that? Before the end of the semester. Oh, okay. Which one? Uh, professional development is before the end of the semester. And what was the assignment? Uh, basically, before the end of the semester, too. I think I put it, I think I made it due the week before finals week, but I'm not real sticky on that. Yeah, it's due. Technically, it's due by Sunday the 3rd. Okay. okay? Thank you. No problem. Other questions? Cool. I'll see you guys on Thursday.